Well, Tom, thank you for that great introduction. I, I really appreciate it. How are you all doing today? Okay, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my journey from the corner store to the corner office. In my book, Winner's Dream, I came to the clear conclusion that there's a perfect correlation between winners having dreams and accomplishing amazing things. But we all start somewhere. I traded in three part-time jobs to be a teenage entrepreneur running a delicatessen in Amityville, Long Island. Doesn't that sound exciting? So I'm broke. Somebody gives me a note for $5,500, 7000 with interest. I make the store a success. I keep it. I miss one payment. I give the store back. That's the deal. So what happens when you're under complete pressure to deliver, you have to focus on one thing and one thing only. That's the customer. And I was between two very large conglomerates, finest supermarket over here and 7-Eleven over here, and my little business is right in the middle. What did I learn? I learned that the little one has to do what the big one is either structurally unable to do or simply unwilling to do because they're lazy. So we focused on three market segments. One was senior citizens. What do we learn about senior citizens? They don't want to leave the house, so we deliver. Then there were the blue collar workers like my dad, flush rich on Friday night and dead broke by Sunday morning. We give them credit, and they keep coming back. But the hard part was getting those high school kids to walk a block and a half past 7-Eleven to come to my little store. After all, why would they? One day, I said, let me go down there to 7-Eleven and see what's going on. I go down to the store. There's 40 young people lined up outside the store and only four inside. I said to one of the people on the line, why are you all out here? There's a big store in there and you're on line. And they're like, well, they think we're gonna take things. I said, don't worry about all that. Follow me down to my store. And I brought them down 40 at a time. I had a little trick though. I had built a video game room on the side of that store with asteroids and Pac-Man. You remember those video games? Pluck those quarters in. Oh yeah, so I let them in 40 at a time. And at the end of a long day, one of the young people said to me, Bill, when we wanna be treated well, have good food and play video games, we come to your store. And when we wanna steal stuff, we go to 7-Eleven. <laughs> it's amazing. They talk a lot about CRM and fancy technologies. You know what my CRM system was? It was a window, and I could see my customers getting off of buses, getting out of cars, walk into my store, and I knew everything about the 500 people that came in that store every day. And I knew that without them returning, because they were very satisfied, the probability of my little business succeeding wasn't very high at all. See, the customer and the customer alone determines whether we win or we lose. You know, you can't lock in on one dream. That was just the beginning. Get me through college, contribute a little bit to my family. But I really wanted to be somebody. I wanted to be in the big city of Manhattan, working in a skyscraper, wearing a suit and tie, climbing the ladder like many of you. One day, we're living in a 1,000 square foot home, my family, in Amityville, Long Island. You ever hear Amityville, Long Island? Yeah, the horror, you got it. On the Great South Bay, every time there was a northeast storm, the house would flood. So I'm about to go for my dream job interview. 
I had just bought a $99 suit at the mall. I was all set, charged it and everything. And there was four and a half feet of water in my home. So as I'm going down the stairs, I get to the fifth from the bottom, my brother Kevin comes up to me, he says, Bill, jump on. Puts me on his shoulder. We're walking through the water all the way out to the front yard. My dad's got the car. My brother pours me in so my pants don't get wet. I sit in the car, my dad drives me to the Long Island Railroad tracks in Amityville. And on the way there, I said to my dad, I love my dad, I said, Dad, I guarantee you I'm coming home tonight with my employee badge in my pocket. This is my dream job. He said, Bill, you're a good guy. Don't put all that pressure on yourself, man. Just do the best you can. I said, I guarantee it. I get out of the car, go up the escalator to the Long Island Railroad with the annual report of Xerox Corporation. The then CEO, a guy named David Kearns, was talking about reinventing this company with total quality management. And you know what was interesting? Xerox was building machines at a higher cost per unit than the offshore competition was actually selling the machines and they were higher quality. You think you got a business model problem there? But it didn't matter to me. I was going for my dream. So all the way to Manhattan, every stop, I just said I'm gonna be the next David Kearns, I wanna be like this guy. I get out of the train, make it up to top of the sixes in Manhattan. And now I'm in the hiring center on the top floor, looking around, and there's young people from Princeton University, Dartmouth, Notre Dame, Penn, and there's me, coming from Long Island, right out of that delicatessen business, going to school, at a Long Island local college, and I'm thinking to myself, man, I may have overshot it a little bit with that guarantee, babe. <laughs> this, is, this is looking rough. But there's that moment where you say, what do I do? Do I panic? Or do I just stay cool and play to my favorite hand? And I said, no, just do what you do. I do what I do well often. I don't do what I don't do so well at all. Let me just do what I do. I talk to 500 people every day and I can start a conversation. So let's try that. Sir, what are you in for? What are you trying to get done? What's your goal today? What, what do you want to do? Are you excited? What, what, are you, what do you think of Manhattan? What do you think of this company called Xerox? Well, I'm playing the field. I'm interviewing a Goldman Sachs and IBM. Burroughs, they were around once and I'll see how it goes. What do you think happened at that moment? Oh, that's when I got strong. This is my day. I will win today because I want it so much more than they do. After nine interviews, they send me uptown, 9 West 57th Street. I get to meet with the big boss. I'm sitting on a bench outside in the reception area next to another young fella. He's waiting to get in for an interview too. I actually think they forgot us. We're sitting there like 40 minutes. I go up to the administrative assistant. I said, Joanne, Joanne on her uh, shirt, Siciliano, her last name. Joanne, please let Mr. Fullwood know I'm here. I'm willing to wait as long as he would like. I'm in no rush. I just want him to know I'm here. She goes in, tells him, they immediately invite me into his office. Now, I'm going down the hall, ready to go see Mr. Fullwood, the big boss. 9 West 57th Street, 38th floor, his office overlooks Central Park. At the hearth of that doorstep, as I step in, I realize I am not in a job interview. I am in a fight for my life because if I get this job, I fundamentally now can be in control of my own destiny. Wow. Wow. I'm looking over his shoulder. I see the park. I'm like, man, this is heaven. We have this great meeting. At the end of the meeting, he said to me, Bill, I really enjoyed the conversation today. And Bill, 
Yes, Mr. Forward? The HR department will be getting in touch with you in the next couple of weeks. Mr. Forward, I don't think you completely understand the situation, sir. He looks at me, kind of tilts his head, and I said, I haven't broken a promise to my father in 21 years. And I guaranteed him I'd have my employee badge in my pocket tonight when I get back to Amityville, Long Island. Silence. Tilts his head a little more. Looks at me seriously. Bill McDermott, as long as you have not committed any crimes, you're hired. And I said, well, Mr. Fullwood, I certainly haven't committed any crimes, so does that mean I'm hired? He goes, yes, it does. So I get up from my seat with such passion. I walk around, I grab him, I put him in a bear hug, and I kind of twisting him and twirling him and everything. And then I finally put him back in his chair safely. I said, thank you, sir. I zoomed out of that office, make my way past Joanne Siciliano, wave to her, get to the elevator, go down 38 floors, run to the corner of 57th and 6th. There's a restaurant called Bun and Burger. I take the quarters out. You needed them then. It's amazing. Put them in the phone, call up mom and dad. Mom and dad, I got to let you know, I got some good news. I'm coming home tonight with my employee badge in my pocket. I got the dream job. Break out the Corbell. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Corbell was hot stuff if you came from Amityville, Iowa, man. So that's one thing, getting the job. Wanting it more. Going for dreams. But then when you get the job, you got to do something with it. So they had very competitive training programs then, and it was important to graduate at the top of your class because then you get the best territory. And one day I'm out there as the apprentice traveling with the senior guy, selling copy machines, electronic printers and typewriters and faxes and all of that nonsense door to door, cold doors in New York City. It's August. It's 95 degrees in the shade. The humidity is 1,000%. We get a lead. I got a copy machine on my back. I got an electronic typewriter in one hand, and I got a briefcase loaded up with brochures in the other, and I'm ready to go, baby. The lead comes in. We zoom uptown, get to a brownstone, four flights up, no elevator. He said, come on, kid, let's go. I go up all the steps, get to the hearth of the door. It's open, and I see this amazing woman, Chanel Sue, decked out, has to be the CEO. No doubt in my mind, as the sweat trickles down my cheek. And then guess what happens? A really stunning event. A giant cat jumps on my shoulder and starts putting these claws deeply through my $99 suit into my skin. And I'm like, damn, I'm young enough that the skin's going to heal, but I'm not so sure about this suit anymore. So I put the briefcase down and the electronic typewriter, copier's still there, because it's in one of those, and I hold the cat. Good kitty. Sweet kitty. Love the kitty. Woman looks at me and she said, wow, you really love animals, don't you? And I said, especially cats. <laughs> and I'll tell you, Garfield has nothing on this cat. No way. Good kitty. So we get in this whole conversation about cats and dogs and life experiences. And the senior guy says to me, hey, kid, you know, come on, man. It's time to plug in the machines and do your demo. And I look at her and I said, hey, you know, I could do that, but you know, a copy machine, you plug it in the wall, it's got a green button that says start, you press it, it makes a copy. And this electronic typewriter, 
You plug it in a wall and it's a lot like that old one you got over there, only it's faster because it's electronic. Now, do you need to see a demonstration? And she says, of course not, honey, I'll take two. <laughs> we get downstairs. I'm still carrying all the stuff now. He gets the orders and he goes, Bill McDermott, you're either gonna be the CEO of Xerox or you're going to jail, man. <laughs> and I said, what's with you people in the jail thing, you know? <laughs> now, years later, this is not published in the book, by the way. Years later, he calls me up. There was a sting operation and he was arrested at JD's bar in Manhattan. He wanted me to be a character witness, but I never tell that story, <laughs> but it's a true story. Yeah, you know, there was this other time. I go to Puerto Rico, and you know, there's these people in the world that everything has to be just right for them. You know, I get the job, I get the car, I get the living conditions, I get enough money, just for me, perfect for me. And then there's these other people who are in service to a company because they think the company will acknowledge work well done and appreciate that and maybe even reward them for that later. So you gotta choose which person are you when you're climbing the ladder. So I get this offer to go to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico was number 67 out of 67 operations, dead last. Just married, newborn baby boy, living in Manhattan, kind of the king of New York type of deal promised the world, didn't have to do it. But the big boss asked me to go straighten the place out. Long story short, I take the challenge. Go to Puerto Rico. Unbelievable. For two weeks, I did nothing but listen to the people. And what do you think the people said to me? The people said, we need a vision. Where are we going? We want the water back. The other guy's a course cutter and he took the water and the donuts. Brilliant. But the third thing, which was the big thing, we want our Christmas party back. We like to dance in Puerto Rico. So I'm like, okay, of all the fundamental nuances that you learn in business school, probably I didn't get this one. So I said, look, let me come back tomorrow. Let me think it through. But if we did this Christmas party, who would it be? Who would do the entertainment? Whoa, Hilbertito Santa Rosa. He's the number one salsa singer in Puerto Rico. No question. Where would we go? The El San Juan Hotel. It's the very best one. What would the event be like? Well, the women would wear beautiful gowns and the men would wear black tie and we would dance till three o'clock in the morning. Wow, that sounds really fun. Come back to the meeting the next day, started out in Spanish. Spanish is terrible. People laugh every 10 word. I finally said, let me switch to Ingo English for the benefit of my gringo American friends. They laugh again. And I said, look, I got good news for you. Yeah. Yeah, I called up Hilbertito last night. He's playing for us at the El San Juan Hotel. The Christmas party is back. We're gonna dance till three o'clock in the morning and have the time of our lives. They erupted with excitement, standing up, puño, senor, you're the greatest. Rocky push-ups, everything perfect. <laughs> and then I said, I wrecked the whole thing. I said, look, there's only one catch. Yeah, what's that? There's nothing noble about dancing to Hilbertito or anyone else at number 67. We're going to be the number one business. We're going to do it this year, and you're going to be number one out of 67, not 67th. What do you think happened then? <sighs> All the oxygen gone. Room totally dead. And I said, look, you trust me. I trust you, one day at a time. Trust is built in drops, and it's lost in buckets. But if we can put a drop in each day, we can change this 
whole world together. Well, lo and behold, like Sea Biscuit, we come around the first turn, gaining a little strength. Mid-year, gaining a lot of strength. Third quarter, now we're striving for the best. And that December, that business became number one in the world, and then came back the next year and repeated again. If enough people care, you can change everything. And sometimes the strength of an idea is in the hearts of the people, and that's even bigger than the heads. Fast forward, number 67 to number one. Not bad, huh? Whew. Fast, yeah, you can clap, it's okay. <laughs> Fast forward, let's go big picture now. Bill McDermott, CEO, SAP. You know, you've gone from that corner store to the corner office. You are there now. What's the common themes? Where are we now? Well, you have to have a vision. The vision has to be there. And our vision was all built on purpose. As Tom said, to help the world run better and improve people's lives. Why the world run better? Very authentic to what we do with our software. Improve people's lives. If it didn't help the economy, if it didn't help the environment, if it didn't help society in some way, probably it's not hitting the purpose button. And we need to be purpose driven. That's what young people want, that's what our customers want, and that's what the world expects from us. And why is that so important? Well, fundamentally, we wanted to get the company younger by one year every year. We wanted to have an inspired workforce just like that one in Puerto Rico. And we wanted to be a customer-driven organization. And to be in service to other people and to the customer is the highest professional calling of a well-run company. So we sell that idea. Then there's the strategy. Now, this is key. We were the number one business software company in enterprise applications and analytics. We participated in 110 billion US dollar market and we were number one. Unfortunately, that market was gonna grow more slowly in the future years. And cloud computing, okay, mobility, and networks, business networks, where commerce would be conducted between companies all on a much faster data model would change fundamentally the way the enterprise would run. And what happened by adopting that strategy and thinking differently, we went from 110 billion US dollar addressable market to at that time 350 billion US dollar addressable market. Today it's a 600 billion market. So you have to enlarge the size of the market and rethink where you can take the company before you can be a true growth company and change the dynamics of the argument. Now, for us, it was inventing HANA, which was an in-memory database platform that could fundamentally process information at breathtaking speeds, and you could run the applications on that in-memory database and reinvent ERP on an in-memory database. We could take the whole company to the cloud, either in a modular one piece at a time or the whole enterprise suite. And we could extend what happened in the enterprise to business networks that would drive procurement, that would drive travel and expense, and that would drive contingent labor, which is the fastest growing workforce in the world, by the way, growing at nearly 50% in every major economy. And then if you could do all of this on a consistent data model, you could fundamentally rethink the single view of the consumer from social to direct to consumer, wholesale, retail, everything on an integrated end-to-end -end basis where the demand chain and the supply chain could be completely integrated. You could do this in 25 distinctly different industries. You could do this for small, mid, and large companies. And you could be a market leader for the generations. So that was the idea. 
Now, you know, when you think about it, that idea was pretty good because that company was valued at around 40 billion market cap on the day we initiated this move. And today it's about 135 billion market cap, triple the revenue, triple the number of employees, and of course, triple the market dynamics in terms of the ecosystem, which is something we're talking about today in a Q&A in a moment. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is we can all do this. It's in front of us, but it does require a lot of courage. And there'll be a lot of changes in the business models that you have to be willing to take on. For example, when you move to a cloud world, the revenue recognition is very different than when you move uh, um, than when you're in an on-premise world. So people said, you'll never make the change. SAP can't make the change. Well, there was a well-known company that you all are pretty well aware of that had a 200 billion market cap advantage over us then that's actually smaller market cap today than us. And what was the learning? We leaned into the change. We pushed the change. We didn't fear the change. And we were going to take all the hits on you know, people judging whether or not we could or couldn't and just do it. So I'm pleased with the progress. We are a work in progress, and I think every company has to have the humility to recognize that we are a work in progress. Now, I'll conclude my formal remarks today by telling you a little story. And this is really more of a, a personal story, a human story. You know, it was um, July of 2015. And I was in a serious accident. It was very interesting, you know, at kind of like the peak of your professional career, peak of everything going the way you had dreamed your life could go. And all of a sudden, on a perfect day, absolutely perfect day, that evening, I had a serious accident. And I'll never forget that day, that moment, because I said, man, what, what just happened? You wake up after an extraordinary fall, badly cut, things not good, and you know you're on the line between being in this planet and somewhere else. And there's this unbelievable power that your mind has. And your mind really wants you to always be in a pleasurable state. It doesn't want you to be in pain. And I just remember my mind saying, you know, Bill, you need to lay down. You need to go to sleep. You've done enough. <laughs> because if you decide to get up, life's going to get a whole lot harder on you. You just stay down. And then there's that thing called your will. And that will finds a way. And my will said, you have a beautiful family. You have a lot of great friends. And at that time, we had around 80,000 people that count on you and you count on them. You just got to find a way to get up, to get out, and to get on with it. And I could just remember crawling, feeling a doorknob, and crawling out about 100 feet to the hearth of a driveway, laying half in the driveway and half in the street, saying, please call 911 and somebody hearing me. And the moral of the story is we're all going to have our, hunt, our thunderbolts. And most people have had thunderbolts far worse than mine. But what I learned is people will never remember how you got knocked down. But they will never forget you for how you get back up and you just keep coming and coming and coming. That's what winners do. Winners dream and winners rise. Thank you very, very much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, huh? thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Love you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bill, it's always great to hear your, your stories, and it's amazing how life lessons from when you're a child as a paper boy all the way through, <laughs> uh, you know, growing up can, can really make you the person you are and the business sure. person you are. So uh, congratulations on all that and sharing some of your stories. Thank you, Tom. Just want to spend a few minutes with you on, on, a, on a couple topics that I think are, are of interest to everybody. Sure. But first, uh, recent earnings announcement. Uh, you must be very proud, an incredible quarter. Uh, Bill said that this is the first time in uh, SAP history cloud revenue exceeded 1 billion euros in the and, quarter, in, in the quarter mm -hmm. and predicted that uh, cloud revenue will exceed traditional software licensing for the first time ever. Correct. And that's largely because of the strength of your uh, cloud platform in the enterprise. So, so Thank congratulations. You. Thank you, Tom. And uh, you, know, you talked about the customer, and, but talk to, what's driving that, that momentum? I mean, you must be really proud, but what, wh where does it go and how do you do it? It's, it's really an innovation-led agenda. And you know, the idea of this customer, and for significant executives like yourselves, is to constantly be humble enough to see the world through the eyes of the customer. Mm -hmm. And the world that we see right now is a world where every CEO I talk to, every leader of business, every IT executive, they want to get a handle on that single view of that consumer. We're in a customer-driven growth revolution. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of companies are learning right now is they've worked a lot on the front-end CRM system. Right. And they're working on a first-generation SaaS application in most cases. They're starting to see some of the not-so-pretty um, vendor behaviors with raising prices and not necessarily giving them enough value. That's one issue. Right. The second issue they're saying, even if I do well on the front end, if I don't fulfill in the supply chain on the back end mm -hmm. by building the right product at the right price and geospatially giving it to the consumer in the right location at the right time, right. because they're on the move, and making sure that that loyalty effect is earned with every transaction. I'm not going to be successful. And there's one simple formula here, guys. A 5% improvement okay, in customer retention is equivalent to a 95% improvement in profit. Right. So there, this value chain has to now be on a new generation platform where the data, the end-to-end -end process, and the immense level of empathy for a customer that's on the move is built into the business model. Right. And that's what we're focused on. Yeah, it's, it's the right focus. I think we would all agree that customer, you're on the European roundtable of industrialists yeah. in the US Business Council. And I think uh, all CEOs share a common agenda, right? It's all, all about the customer. So it's, that's what we're all talking about. Yeah, and you know, it, it's so funny, Tom. Like, I go, I go back in my life experiences to the early days. And I think what happens to all of us is we do a lot. We get big. We, we, we get uh, you know, more experience, and we think we get smarter, and all this other stuff. But the reason that I think the humility of going back to the beginning is necessary, really necessary, right. because we have to wear the jacket. You know, we have to be the ones that drive the change. And the change doesn't get driven unless the empathy mm. is built into the equation. And the empathy has to start at the top. Right. And, and one of your, your drivers of, of growth is, is clearly the capabilities of your product suites. Right. But you've referred to it as the intelligent enterprise. And, and CIOs like myself, who are not only your customer, but I'm the end customer for a lot of people in the room as well. Right. So what you'll hear us talk about uh, solutions that cross business units. We want that holistic view, that data-driven insights. Right. And, and some of that's driven by innovation and analytics and things like that. But talk to us quickly about what the intelligent enterprise looks like for you and how does that further drive that strategy for SAP? Sure. So conservatively, when you do the research, People are talking about a four trillion US dollar market opportunity for AI 
driven business between now and 2025. So the debate is, in some circles, the social debate is, will AI take away jobs? Will AI create jobs? Mm -hmm. On the short run of looking at this, AI is a net job improver by a few million jobs in the next few years because the work will change, but there'll be more work because there will be more productivity in the companies that do this right. So I just wanted to put a little bit of an announcement on, on that and do the research and how that touches your business and how you comport that to your customers. But I'll give you a little tip. The world is sensitive to this topic, mm -hmm. and my recommendation is that, again, you show tremendous empathy for this topic. And basically, think about it this way. Isn't it about time the companies started to work for the humans so the humans could have a better life and the humans could work on things that are knowledge-based and that really takes advantage of the human dynamic called judgment, which is something that no computer has the way a human has it because they're not empathetic like we are. And that, to me, is a very important mm -hmm. consideration. Now, in terms of the technology piece, you need a common data model. The problem is with these companies, the data is everywhere. So it's a mess. And every time you want to fulfill and achieve that single view vision, mm -hmm. you get screwed up because, well, she's got the mobile. We got her profile in one database, but not the other database. And if she's shopping here and we acquired that, we don't know what to do and blah, blah, blah. That never happens anywhere here. Right. But hypothetically. Exactly. So here's one of the really big inventions that SAP will announce at Sapphire. I give you early preview today. This is called, like, you know, secrets. Um, I know nobody's going to repeat it. Nobody's even going to tell a friend. I believe me, it won't happen, Tom. Few, few but, tweeters out here. So here's the idea. What if, and incidentally, I, I, this is so funny. I go to an investor conference in New York, right? They say to me, well, Bill, you got S4 HANA, which is this unbelievable intelligent enterprise suite. So think of ERP built on an in-memory database, HANA, fully integrated and designed. And they say, well, Bill, what, what databases does HANA, as for HANA run on? <laughs> and I said to myself, is this a trick question? And they said, well, what do you mean? S for HANA, okay? There's only one database, it's HANA. And we engineered it to completely integrate with an ERP system. So you'd have one common data model across an enterprise. But here's the issue. You say, but I do business with hyperscalers. I have data that's all over the place. And I still like your vision, but what are you going to do with the data that's not in HANA? Are you going to make me put all the data in HANA before you can give me my Nirvana? Right. HANA Nirvana. I don't know. I like that. Um, HANA Nirvana. And I said, no, I want, you to, I want you to be in a state of Nirvana all the time. So what we're going to do is HANA is going to take the data source, not move the data. Analyze it without moving it, which not only gives you speed, but it also gives you security. Yep. Most of these other database systems, you're moving the data, analyzing the data, and putting it back. We go get the data from any source, transact the data without moving it, totally secure, and we give you the end-to-end -end process. The announcement will be something called the data management suite, I like which it. is based on HANA. And this particular application is called the data hub, where HANA becomes the control tower for the enterprise in getting the data, moving it into the in-memory processing speed, and then executing the transaction. No movement, full security, no speed degradation. Change the game. Very, very key. That sounds very cool. Now, the other thing is this. I've been in enough meetings with very big business cards like yourself, Tom, and they'll tell me, Bill, I'm paying too much, I'm getting too little value, and it doesn't integrate. Okay? And we also have to do our maximum best on all the integration challenges. So it's not just other right, companies. Right. It's also us. Mm -hmm. But 
they're very upset right now with the front end LOB cloud providers in the market. And they're feeling the old tactics of the enterprise software right. uh, of the 90s. So to which I reply, omni-channel, e-commerce, sales, marketing, field service, all on HANA, all fully integrated into the back-end core systems. Sounds good. Let me, let me piggyback on that. One, one final question, Bill, sure. for uh, what I think is really relevant for this audience. You, you've done a great job in the corporations, the enterprise, if you will. Right. The, um, the architecture of S4 HANA and the modularization of it right. is allowing small and mid-sized businesses yes. to, to better leverage that, right? But you've got competitors still out there looming. You've got software as a service cloud native companies. You've right. got a a resurgent IBM, a growing Google, and others out there, um, AWS powerhouse. Any advice to this audience, full of distributors, resellers, channel partners, Ingram Micro employees, on how do we help you or how do you help us get more SAP out there in the marketplace for some of these SMB customers? Sure. So let me spend just one second on the business network because it never gets enough attention, and I think it can really help a lot of businesses make some money. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the business network, which is a public multi-tenant cloud application, all in an open global network. So let's take procurement as an example. Okay. There's a CFO of a company called Mediafly who educated me on this. He said, Bill, I use SAP Ariba not only to drive my procurement um, business within my company so I spend less and get more, but I use it as a front-end CRM system. How do you do that, John? Well, you have three and a half million suppliers in the Ariba network. And once I'm in the network, I'm now upselling and cross-selling everything I have in the network, and I use it as a front-end CRM system to get to the Fortune 50, which I could have never done without right, right. Ariba. Think about that. The second thing which I think is interesting is concur, travel and expense. So you think about ground, air, hotel, food, entertainment. The magic of this thing is the employee is on the move, and all those things are happening on the device, but then it gets updated in an ERP system. So companies love that. But here, you could be in that network, and you could be selling in to that network depending on what your business model is. And then the other one that I, and incidentally, that Ariba network, that Concur network, when you add them up, it's over two trillion two trillion dollars that are flowing through those networks. So when you think about SAP, Amazon, Alibaba, eBay, combine them all, it's yep. smaller than SAP. Now, contingent labor, this is a big one. Whether it's to help you run your business better or to get you in the network. The fastest growing job opportunity, especially for millennials, will be in temporary work. Mm -hmm contract work, three months, six months, a year. You have to source these people, you have to put them into the right initiative, you have to make sure they're secure, and you have to manage that headcount with your full-time equivalents so you know your cost base at any one time. You ramp it up, you ramp it down. This is all done for you with Field Glass. I kindly mention this to you because I don't think the ecosystem has fully been initiated right. in our networks, and I want you to make money and create wealth um, for your companies, but also success for your customers. And we're very open to all of you. Now, as it relates to, yeah, we know SAP's cool for the big ones, but what about the mid and the small ones? Couple things. One, SAP has business by design, um, which is a cloud multi-tenant um, system, ERP system. SAP has business one, now on HANA, which is a small, medium-sized business system, and this is obviously only sold through an indirect network. So I hope that you're getting your fair share of that business. Mm -hmm. Now, the S4 HANA conversation that we're having today, it is also for small and mid. Why is this? Because it is completely modular. So you might have companies out there that want to do business with, uh, with you on a cloud finance application or a HCM application, or potentially some of the network applications, or potentially a CRM application, 
All of this is modular. It can be done in pieces or it can be done as a suite. And I also will tell you the HANA database itself, it's an amazing opportunity because we started out marketing it as a runtime license with our ERP system. But we are moving way beyond that now in a full use database license. We have 20,000 companies in the world, by the way, on HANA right now. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be with us on HANA, you might say, yeah, engineering. You might say construction. You might say geospatial. You might have very unique applications that you're trying to build out to serve your customers. So think of us on the data layer, think of us on the application layer, and think of us on the network layer, and think of everything we do in the cloud. That doesn't mean we don't do on-premise or own data center. It just means that we engineered for the cloud, because anything engineered for the cloud can also run in someone's own data center. That's the reality, and it's going to be a hybrid world for a long time, so we're leaning into that. So join up. Um, work with us. We have Arlen Shankman here, okay. who's running our whole partner channel, Arlen Shankman. Um, you now know me. Hopefully, you feel comfortable in talking to me. I'm pretty approachable. Bill.McDermott at SAP.com. And we want to work with you. And incidentally, you mentioned um, IBM, uh, some other companies. Our approach to this whole cloud business is to be open. So SAP can do it all in the SAP cloud. But we recognize the hyperscalers, whether it's Azure, it's Amazon, it's Google Cloud Platform, it's HP, it's Dell, it's IBM. They all have different motions in how they serve their customers in the cloud. Our job is to be the value add yep. and not to inhibit customer choice. We lean into customer choice. And I think that's very different. Because most of the big software companies in our space, they want to own the whole wallet share thing. Right. To which I reply, ridiculous. I want to own customer satisfaction, repeat business, and loyalty. I want to think of the customer with the same humble roots as I had them in the delicatessen. I need you to come back. Right. If you don't come <clears throat> back, right. no hits, no <clears throat> runs, right. no errors. We're done. Right. And as a customer, I can say that Bill walks the talk, and uh, you, uh, you heard a lot from Bill today about uh, people, leadership, innovation, but the customer theme was, was consistent. I'd love to spend another couple hours up here talking to you. Unfortunately, we have to get some lunch, yes. but I, I thank you for your time. Hopefully, uh, this was some great insight. I, um, I think that uh, Bill's journey from, um, from corner store to, to CEO is a fabulous one. And uh, we're honored to have you, Bill, and I look Thank forward you. to working with you going forward. Thank you, Tom. Let's hear it for Bill Thanks, McCurry. everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tom.